All right, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Community Bible Church and Community Bible Church Online. I am actually recording the announcements this morning. As I announced last week, we will not be here for the next two Sundays, but I'm going to be here with you virtually today. And we're so glad that you chose to join us both here and online. A couple of things that I wanted to remind you of. First, out of the starting gate, our new text to give number for those of you that are online and concerned about this. The number has changed. It is 954 271 1134. 954 271 1134. Text the word give in the amount that you want to give. You'll have to set it up the first time, but after that, the process is simplified. But that is the new text to give number. The old one will not work if you have that in your phone, so, uh, so wipe that out. I also want to let you know this is not the number for you to communicate with us. You will be getting from a, a different number, and it's, a, it's not a full phone number. It's about five numbers. You should have it in your phone if you have subscribed to any of our notifications. So you'll be able to get that and make sure that you can, you can answer us back on some of those texts if you'd like to communicate with us there. The best way to get in touch with us is send an email to info at cbcfl.org. That's info at cbcfl.org. By the way, it, while you're there, if you are not subscribed to the text, the texting program and all of our notification system, make sure that you give us your phone number and ask to be added to the list. We need your permission to do that, and then we'll make sure that we add you. So please make sure you get on that list. That's how we are communicating with everybody. Also, stay tuned to all of our social media channels. We are right now on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I know there are a lot of other things out there like are you going to do reels? And the answer is no. Uh, although I just heard recently that TikTok and LinkedIn are the two that have the most organic reach. So don't think I'm going to do TikTok, but I see a lot of just nonsense on a lot of this. But that's how we're choosing to communicate on social media right now. And make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure that you, that, that you like our Facebook page or you follow us on Twitter or you follow us on Instagram and you'll get all of those notifications. So we'd love to have you join us there. Now, uh, in this morning, in just a few moments, if you're joining us online, you're going to hear a message from me, an archive message from a number of years ago, and you'll be able to tell that it's a number of years ago. It's called, When Getting Better Isn't Good Enough. When Getting Better Isn't Good Enough. If you're here uh, in person with us this morning and you're viewing this, you're going to be treated to another uh, episode in Andy Stanley's teaching series, and so we're gonna, you're going to hear that here in just a a few moments, but make sure you hang in there with us. Make sure to get together that you're fellowshipping today. Make sure that if you are online, you are, are communicating in the chat room, and we would certainly appreciate that. And we will hopefully see you next week here on Father's Day as Fred Ravel will be with us from First Priority for both of our services and streaming live. We'll see you soon. Water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine
morning in Luke chapter 22 talking about when getting better isn't good enough when getting better isn't good enough Luke chapter 22 perhaps a familiar passage of scripture but nonetheless an interesting one we're reading from the New International Version if you're on a device or as I already told you page 856 and your Bibles in the pews Luke chapter 22 and beginning in verse 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But then he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I've prayed for you. Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times, and I three times, that you know me. And let's pray. Father, as always now, we pray that you will bless your word as it goes forth. Father, we, we pray that you will give us wisdom and understanding. We thank you that you love us where you're at, but that where we're at, but that you don't leave us there. So Father, I pray that you'll bless this message now and bless these folks for being present 
And we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Not sure whether you've seen the movie Hidden Figures, but it is worth a watch. It's one of these things that you hear about and you may see on, on TV that looks like, oh, this may be a decent movie, but I will tell you that it was a long movie and Pam and I were riveted to it. Hidden Figures is about the Afri African American women who actually worked at NASA during, the, the, during when John Glenn first went up into space. There were actually three of them that were sort of the key characters. Uh, and it was interesting. Octavia Spencer, Katherine Johnson, and Mary Jackson. Now, Katherine Johnson was the one who had this brain. They called them human computers. In fact, they referred to all of the people that worked in these particular departments as computers. They got the first IBM computer while the human computers were there. It's interesting because Katherine Johnson knew, had this ability to do these figures and work to tra trajectories out on a big chalkboard. And it was, it was interesting because they, they brought her in and she had such hope. And what they were showing juxtaposed to the whole thing was the struggle of desegregation and what was happening with, uh, during that time. There were still at the time, and I, I will use the terminology because that's the term that was used then, there was colored bathrooms and there were white bathrooms. Now here is this woman who is an absolute genius and she walks in, she's, she's called in to be the human computer. She's the only female and she's the only black person that is in there. It's all a sea of white men and white shirts. And they kind of watch her coming in and, and it's interesting because her boss starts to see this woman's potential and sees what she's capable of. And even John Glenn, she gets, she gets herself into this meeting and John Glenn is so impressed with her, he's like, I trust these, this woman's calculations. Now, she's trying to calculate how he's going to come home and she's doing it all by hand. Meanwhile, there were still colored bathrooms, colored water fountains, colored lunch, lunch rooms. Every day, at a certain time, Katherine Johnson would leave her desk and she would be gone for 45 minutes and the boss was furious with it. She was doing great work, but he was furious. He didn't know where she was going. One day she, she left and it was raining. She comes back and she's totally just soaking wet. Now meanwhile, in the midst of all of that, she had went to pour coffee and the white guys that were there didn't like that. So they got her her own colored coffee pot that she would have to use. She comes in, she's soaking wet, wet and the boss decides to go after her in front of everybody else. He goes, where do you go every day? And Katherine Johnson lost it. She said, I'm going to the bathroom. He says, what do you mean you're going to the bathroom? The bathroom is right out here. She goes, I can't use that bathroom. My bathroom is a half a mile walk. And her boss went, because here's the woman that they are trusting to calculate the person to calculate bringing the white astronaut home. And she can't eat where they eat, relieve herself where they relieve themselves. She can't drink from the same fountain as them at the time. And so they, they showed this struggle and so it was this amazing thing because you see that here, here this woman had all of this mathematical ability and she's hired by NASA and it looks like things were getting better for African Americans. Meanwhile, it wasn't. Have you ever, have you ever wanted that you think things are getting better? You, you see how many times we think, we think that it, it's better? Okay, no, it's getting better. Society's getting better. Uh, my relationship's getting better. Things are getting better. And all of a sudden, something breaks and you realize it ain't good enough. Sometimes being better isn't good enough. I think it was Winston Churchill that uh, he, his, his quote, his famous quote was, sometimes you have to do more than your best, you have to do what's required. My parents used to say, well, you just do your best. Okay, but my best sometimes wasn't good enough. Sometimes I was going to be, have to do what's right. I mean, I could do my best, but it was required that I got a certain grade to get out of college. And so I could go in and tell them I do my, did my best, but they say, but you didn't do what was required. 
We all face this time when we feel like we've done our best. And particularly, there are others that keep, that keep looking at us. And, you know, you, you, you think about it and, and, and you say, I'm getting better, but sometimes it's just not good enough. And then you face your own struggles. And you think, just think about your own struggles that you have for a minute. Those, I like to, they're called besetting sins. I know it's sort of an outdated term, but it's that thing that you're addicted to, that thing that happens, and that you promise God, I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. And you start to bargain with him. God, if I do it again, I'll be a missionary in Africa. You know, you, you bargain with him. God, if, if I do this again, you, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go, you know, stab myself in the eye with a knitting needle. I mean, you, you talk about how you're going to punish yourself. If I do this again, because it's, I, and then, and then you say, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. And then the next day, boom, something happens, and you realize that better just wasn't good enough. Do you know how many people I see at that point that run away from God? Because they think somehow, if I failed, that that failure is final. That if I keep having this struggle, I can't possibly be the, the right person of faith. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I'm not trusting God enough. Maybe, maybe I'm, not, I'm not praying enough. Maybe I'm not going to church enough. Maybe I'm not... I mean, you can fill in the blank. Because that's what we do. And yet there always seems to be a struggle. I was almost relieved when I read this story. This is an interesting story that we're going to look at for a moment and see how all of this comes together. And what do we do about this? What do we do when, when being, being better isn't good enough? I mean, how do, we, how do we focus on this? And there's an interesting lesson that Jesus actually teaches to the disciples. But before we dig into it, I just want to give you a little bit of background. There is some discrepancy among people who do the harmony of the Gospels exactly as to where all of this occurred. Now, most believe that at this point, what has happened is that, is that Jesus has probably already given the, the, what we call the Last Supper. They've already eaten a little bit of this. And you remember in some of the Gospel recordings, uh, especially John, shows how Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Many of the Harmony of the Gospel folks, the theologians, believe that this discussion that Jesus had was right in the middle of that, which is what prompted him to get up and wash their feet. Because <clears throat> Luke records that a dispute rises among them. So we're in this sort of Last Supper thing, and, and, and so notice what happens, and let's run through the text real quick. Notice verse 24, it starts out, and it's very interesting, Luke says, a dispute. You, ever, you know what a dispute is? You go over to the Middle East, they call them border disputes. You know what a border dispute usually means? Guns and tanks and ammo and people are losing their lives. A dispute is not just, oh, we're having a little tad bit of a disagreement about this. No, these guys were in a full-blown, all-out dispute on, look at this, which one of them was considered to be, read that, what's it say? Considered to be the what? The disciples. Here they are with Jesus. And a dispute arises with them about who is number one. Now, how many times have we seen these things happen with the disciples? Remember James and John, the parents, the mother came to them and said, Hey, Jesus, when you get to your kingdom, please let one of my sons sit on your left hand and one on your right. Well, that ticked the rest of the disciples off because they were asking for this sort of position of, a, of authority. Because remember when there were meals, it was all about where you sat. So there was, you had one person that sat here to the right and then to the left. And then the next most important person sat to the second right. So there was this positionality that occurred. So now this dispute is going on with the disciples about who's number one, who's the most important disciple, who's the greatest one among them. And you can almost hear, hear all of this going on. James and John and Peter all arguing about who's number one, who's number one, who's number one. And so Jesus looks at them and says, the kings of the Gentiles, he goes after the Gentiles, they lord it over them. In other words, when they have this, we were talking about positionality and people being concerned about their titles and everything before church with some folks. That people are more concerned about titles and their positions than anything else. And he says the king, these, these lords of the Gentiles, these kings of the Gentiles, they wind up lording it over everybody else. They take their position and they use their position, position to manipulate and to twist and to turn and to control. 
So in other words, when they get to the position, they absolutely love it. I was telling some folks about my professor I had at uh, my undergraduate at Miami Christian College, and he, <laughs> Dave, uh, Dave actually went, and he, he made us call him Dave. He, he, he did not want to be called, he went and got his, his doctorate, so that when anybody tried to call him doctor, he would tell them, don't call me doctor. And the, the, the administration didn't like it, because everybody liked to be called professor, and this and that. And, and he, was, he wanted to just be called Dave. He really didn't care about the title. But more people care about what their titles are than anything else. And he says, this is exactly what these people do. They take their titles and they wind up taking the position and they manipulate. And then he says to this, but you, verse 26, he says, they exercise authority over all, call themselves benefactors. Verse 26, but you are not to be like that. He said, that, you're not supposed to do that. That's not who you are. He says, instead, the greatest of, among you should be what? Be like the young, should be like the youngest. Among you should be like the youngest. And the one who rules, like the one who serves. Here he goes again. Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter, folks. See, it matters to you what your position is. And it matters to you who you talk to. It matters to you who's unfriending you and who's friending you. It matters to you with all of those things. But it, it really shouldn't matter because the greatest among you should be like a child. Should not be ruling over you. So then he says, verse 27, For who is greater, the one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Ooh. You know, I've talked to people, and if you've ever, ever actually been out, you can see folks, if you've ever been even in the serving business, like waiter, waitressing, it's like one of the worst, thankless jobs around. Because no matter, if, if something happened back in the kitchen, guess who's getting blamed? I had that this morning with my phone company, the woman that I had to talk to, because as you know, my daughter's it's her birthday today, and she's traveling internationally, and we were supposed to have an international plan set, and we didn't get it. And so here's Bob, of course, always being challenged at this moment. When I have to come to church and talk about patience and kindness and serving, that I'm on the phone with this woman going, you've got to get this done from here. You know, like that, kind of like that. You know, kind of like you guys, you're in the car, you're arguing, hey, then you got to, hey, good morning, how are you this morning? Thank the Lord, it's a great day. You know, you know how it goes. We all we all have those struggles and we, we fight. So so and so and so at any rate, he says the ones at the table are the one who serves because because actually the people who are being served often will say, Oh, you are serving me. I'm the customer. I'm the one that's always right. He says, Is it not the one who is at the table? But I among you who've been at the table, I'm the one who serves. And then I love what he says to them. I just want you to watch this because we're going to pull all this together. But he looks at them and he goes, you know what all you guys have done? You're all talking about being number one. But guess what? You have been with me through every one. You've stood by me in all of my trials. You've been there. You guys have been there with me through every trial that I faced. Every time they've talked about killing me. Every time I've been challenged. Every time the religious leaders have been there and have tried to clean my clock. You guys have been there. You've been with me through everything. You've watched all of this happen. And then he looks at them and he says this. I love this. Watch this. And I confer on you a kingdom. Now wait a minute. They were just arguing about who was number one. He just told them that you're, you don't want to be like the Gentiles and you don't want to lord this over them. But he says, look, you've been with me, so guess what? Not because of that, but just because I want to. I am going to confer on you a kingdom as my father conferred one on me. And then he says this, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. You guys, you're going to be there with me. And he says, and in my kingdom, and you're going to sit on thrones, and you're going to be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So watch what Jesus has done. Here are these bunch of yo-yos are arguing about who's number one. And he's told them, you guys can't do that. That's not who you're supposed to be. But he says, you know what? You've been with me. You've been faithful with me through all of these trials. And so guess what? I am now, right now, not waiting. I'm conferring on you a kingdom. You are going to rule and reign with me. You're going to sit at my table in my Father's kingdom. You're going to be one, ones that are going to be there. In fact, you're going to be watching over the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were probably like, wow. But you know, but you've gone from up here arguing about who's number one. Jesus has said, no, that's not who we're supposed to be like. And so it's like, okay, well, we feel kind of bad now. Then all of a sudden he says, okay, guys, you are getting a kingdom. 
our own kingdom. Really. But, but as always, something's often going to go wrong. Verse 31. Poor Peter. You know, look, I love this. He looks over at Peter and he goes, Simon, Simon. It's almost like, Simon, Simon, Simon. My mom used to do that. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. I knew I was in trouble when it was either Robert William or it was Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. My wife does that now. Bob, Bob, Bob. Okay. So it's, he's like, Simon, Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift all of you. Now, notice who he's talking to. He looks at Simon. He said, Simon, listen to me. Satan wants to sift all of you. Not just you, Simon. Because who was considered to be the head of the disciples? Every time the disciples are mentioned, who were the first three? Peter, James, and John. There was an inner circle of an inner circle of an inner circle. But Peter was always the first guy. That's why uh, the Catholic Church came up and said Peter was the first pope. But Peter was certainly the heir apparent of the church. And he was the leader. And he was the leader of the disciples. And so he looks at Peter and he goes, Simon, Simon, listen to me. Satan wants to take all of you and sift you like wheat. He wants to run you through the thresher, man. He wants to grind you down. But I want you to know that I've prayed for you. He wants you. He wants to grind you down. Every last one of you. He wants to get the last little bit. He wants to beat you down in the midst of all this. But I want you to know that I've prayed for you. And he says, Simon, I prayed for you, Simon, because you're the leader of this bunch of derelicts that we have here. He says, now listen, I added that in. He says, so I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Now, we know what happens. His faith fails. Hey, he denies Jesus. The only worst guy in the, in the midst of all this was Judas. But he says, I pray that your faith may not fail. Now, watch this. What, th if you, it, it's easy to miss this, but it's so important. Watch. And when you have turned back, did you get that? Not if you turn back, Simon. When you turn back, Simon, I've, I've prayed for you. And no matter what happens, I believe in you. When you turn back, strengthen your brothers. You're going to be the guy when you turn it back around. They're going to be looking to you for strength. you got to do this. And then I love it. Isn't it typical of us? Somebody tells us this is what's going to happen. I, I, I kind of liken it to parents. You know, you tell, your, you tell your kids, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And, and, you know, they don't listen to you because you don't know anything. You know nothing, right? I mean, it's that, you know, zilch, zero, zip, not a nothing. So they go ahead and they do it anyway. And then later on, about 20 years later, they go, oh, you know, you, weren't, you were pretty smart. No, I just made mistakes. That's what I did. Now in this case, it's not that, that Jesus made any mistakes, but he says, when you turn back, he says, you just strengthen, you just strengthen your brothers. And then, but Peter goes, wait a minute. I know that's how you said it is, but guess what? That's not how it is, Jesus. You're wrong. In fact, look at what Peter says. Lord... Two worst things that could possibly happen. I will go to prison with you or I will die for you. Jesus, if you get locked up, I'll be sitting there right next to you. Jesus, if you die, I'm going to die with you. Now you would think that this impassioned plea, this impassioned uh, motivational speech by Peter all right, yeah, probably the rest of the disciples are like, all right, yeah, 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 we're with you. And Jesus looks at Peter, and he cuts his legs out from under him, and he says to them, um, Peter, verse 34, before the rooster crows today, 
you will deny three times that you know me. Wow. Now, it's quite interesting to me. I don't know whether it's to you to watch the flow of this, of what goes on in this story. Because here they are, they've, in, they've in, had the, had the uh, Passover meal together, and, and so, so they're arguing about who number one is, and Jesus says, Lord, you, you, look, you guys don't want to be like this, but guess what? I'm conferring on you a kingdom, because you have been with me, you have seen everything, you have, you have believed in me, and then, and then he says, but guess what, Simon, I need to lead you to know that Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I prayed for you. And listen, when you turn it back around again, because I believe in you, when you turn that whole thing back around, then guess what? I need you to strengthen your brothers. And Peter does what all of us do. He stands up and he goes, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. That's not going to be the way it is. I will never, ever, ever be away from you. I will be next to you in prison. I will be next to you when you die. I'm not going to leave your side. And Peter must have been so disappointed when Jesus said, Peter, guess what's going to happen? You're going to deny me three times. Jesus goes on and continues to teach after that, but there's an interesting lesson here. Because sometimes when you're trying to get better, it's not going to be good enough. You ever, do you see yourself in this story? Because I see myself in it where it's like, no, 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 that, I'm, I'm following him. And yes, he's conferred on me a kingdom in a sense. Not that I have a literal kingdom, but he's called me to be about kingdom business. And he's brought me in to be part of his kingdom. And I'm called a child of God. And all of these things that he's confer, conferred on us as, as Christians, we are, we are heirs to his throne. We are heirs to so much. Join heirs with Jesus Christ, Paul tells us. We have all of this stuff. And he says, just remember, don't lord it over anybody. You're supposed to be serving. But Satan's going to come after you and he's going to want to do all of these different things to you. And I'm praying for you. Read John 17. He prays for all of us. Not just his immediate disciples. But then he says, when you turn it back around. See, here's what's going to happen. I don't know what your struggle is right now. I've seen people struggle with addictions. I've had friends that have struggled with addiction. And you go through this cycle of, of things that you say, I'm not going to do this. You know, I'm not going to curse at that person that pulls in front of me again. I'm going to be better tomorrow. And then all of a sudden, five people pull in front of you. Not one. You ever notice that? It's like if you decide to go on a diet and you say, I'm not going to eat the chocolate cake. And everywhere you go, starting off that morning, everybody's eating chocolate cake because you're trying to stay away from it. You know, I'm not going to curse at this bad driver. Five of them come in and cut you off, just testing every part of you. Or, or I'm, not, I'm not going to have that alcohol again. And suddenly, everywhere you go, somebody's offering you something. Wrong. I'm not going to take that pill. Or I'm not going to click on that site. And there it is. It's all right there. And you fail. I was trying to be better. I tried. And I'm, I'm so frustrated with trying to get better that I'm not getting better and it's just, it's not good enough. And so what happens is we often make the mistake of Judas and not Peter and we walk away. So what do we learn from this? What's our, our lesson in, in this whole sort of entire thing? I, here it is. It's real simple. If we want to get past all of this cycle that we get in, I have to see me as God sees me. No, let me say that again. You, I have to see me as God sees me. That's isn't it interesting what happened. But notice how Jesus looked at them. Jesus is telling them, look, I, I can see that you guys are, are arguing about who's number one. But he said, listen, you have a kingdom. You are kings. You are rulers. You're going to be sitting with me at the type table. You're going to be ruling over the kings, uh, over all the kingdoms of Israel. You're going to be over the 12 tribes. I see you all as rulers, as kings, as joint heirs. This is when I look at you. This is who I see. But I know... Satan's going to try to sift you, but I tell you what, I believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. And I believe that you're going to turn it around. And when you do, I need you to strengthen everybody else. 
And you're going to argue and say, no, 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 no. That's, I don't have that. The worst thing you could ever do is to deny the weakness. The worst thing you could ever do is say, this doesn't exist. I don't have this problem. The worst thing you can ever do is say, I don't have the addiction. I don't have this problem. This is not an issue for me anymore. The moment that you do it, watch out because then it's, that's when it's going to come. And you're going to hear the proverbial rooster crow in the distance. The problem is, is that we don't see ourselves as Jesus sees us. Think about a couple of things, and I'll, I'm, they're not up there. I'll just give them to you. He, I already said that he sees who we can become, not, not just who we are. He sees who we are. But he's always seeing who we can become in him. He, he sees that Peter's going to be able to turn it back around. He sees that they're going to be, they're, they're, that they're ultimately going to be rulers. He sees who they're going to become, not just who they are. It's, it's so hard because we don't see ourselves as God sees us. And I know growing up in the church, we had all the theology that we would sing. And I know there's a, there's a healthy balance because we have to understand that we're sinners. And when we understand that we're sinners and we truly get that, that we can't approach a holy God. But because we can now in the person of Jesus Christ, which is where we understand grace, you have to, you have, to have those things coexist and understand that. But we used to sing, what, you know, we used to sing uh, songs about, you know, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the you know, we we talk about he's such a worm as I. You know, we call ourselves worms and all these kind of things. And you know if you've been going to church for any length of time, if you were in a very sort of fundamentalist church, that in order to feel good on Sunday, you had to feel bad. You know, like the, the preacher really had to give it to you on Sunday morning. You were, oh, oh man, it may, it may have even been angry, you know, yelling and screaming. And then, boy, he really stepped on my toes this morning. And so I think that we, we really didn't view ourselves as God sees us because there's this healthy thing that God sees us as sinners, but he says, you know what? I gave my life for you. So you may feel like you're a worm, and I get that, but you're not when it comes to me because I loved you enough to come and die on the cross for you, to pay that penalty, to pull you to myself, to draw you out, to tell you that I loved you. See, he, he, he sees what we can become. But I want you to know something else. He sees our blind spots. Whew. I'm not going to ask how many of you think you got blind spots because I would be afraid that all of you wouldn't raise your hand. And all of that, which means right there, it's a blind spot. You got that. I don't want to embarrass anybody because we all have them. We all, we all say, that's never going to happen to me. We all say, oh no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I could never do that. Oh no, there's, there's no way. In fact, I will never deny Jesus. As a matter of fact, I will die for him. And then someone puts the gun to your head and you're like, who? We all have blind spots. Those blind spots could manifest themselves in addictions, in poor relationships, in something else. And that blind spot is there and we just don't see it. You know what I'm talking about with a blind spot. You ever been driving down the road? I had somebody in my blind spot the other day and it was only by the grace of God on 595. By the time it all happened, they moved over into my blind spot and I had my signal on. They did not. I was on 595 and I swerved away from them and then the person in front of me slammed on their brakes. Their bumper was, must have been this close to me and I turned again and, and I didn't even look in my mirror to see if there was anybody to the right because I was in the middle lane and, and I was just like, oh God. And over I went and I realized, thank God there was nobody there. But they were in the blind spot. They were right there and I didn't even see them. How many times if you had something where you're trying to get better and your blind spot comes around. Jesus knew what the blind spots were for the disciples. They're arguing about who's number one and so what does he do? He gives them a brief lecture and then he says forget it and he bows down and he washes their feet. Because the blind spot was we're, we're all important. We're all number one. Peter had a blind spot. Man, Peter was always a guy that was standing up and his mouth got ahead of his behavior. Peter's always the guy that's standing up. No, 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 Lord, I'm... Jesus said, Peter, this is what's going to happen. But I love that part where he says, but just remember, when you turn it back around, when you come back around, because it's going to happen, Peter, 
I want you to strengthen your brothers. See, so, so he, these are what we can become. He sees our blind spots and he also sees our belief of who we think we are versus who he believes and knows we are. See, Peter, right after all of that happened, and we don't have time to look at the rest of the scriptures, he was devastated. Because if you remember how the story sort of ended, one of the gospel accounts records that Peter's out there, and the third time he's out there warming his hands, he's within eye shot of Jesus. And so they said, wait, you were with the Galilean guy, Jesus, right? And Peter says, no, I don't know him. And it says Peter cursed at them. And just at that moment, his eyes locked eyes with Jesus. Could you imagine that? And you know, if I would have been Jesus, I would have went, <laughs> told you so. <laughs> Come on, don't you want to do that as a parent sometime? I knew it, but you didn't listen to me. Right? I told you you were going to do that. There was sadness in his eyes. He said, Peter went out and wept bitterly. And that's why in John 21, and you can read that story later, we've looked at it at Easter before, that, that Peter finds out that it's Jesus on the shore. And he dives in the water and gets to him. And that's when, after they've eaten, that's when Jesus says, um, watch, Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. He said then, feed my sheep, strengthen your brothers. A little while later, Peter, do you love me? Oh. Jesus, you know I love you. Then, feed my sheep i.e. strengthen your brothers. Peter, do you love me? He says, Peter was frustrated. He says, Lord, you know I love you. He said then, feed my sheep. Strengthen your brothers. And even at that moment, if you remember the story, Peter was like, what about him? He points over to John. What's he going to do? And Jesus said, Peter, listen to me. It, it doesn't matter if I let him stay alive until I return again. Then he said this, you follow me. Peter, you haven't learned the lesson yet, but I believe in you. I know, I know who you're going to become. I know what you're going to do. I know what my purpose and my destiny is for you, and I see that. And I think sometimes that we lose sight of who, what God sees in us because he sees the blind spots and he sees who we can become. Isn't it? It's always that, that kind of thing Paul talked about in Romans 7. There's the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the this evil that I don't want to do, that I wind up doing. And, and I'm, I'm constantly struggling with this. And it's like, no duh, Paul. That's what we all go through. But thankfully, he said it. You see, sometimes being better isn't good enough. But God says, that's okay because one day I'm going to make you good enough. One day, I'm, I know what you're going to become. One day, I know what you're going to accomplish. One day, I know you're going to be at home with me. And you are going to be with me in my kingdom. And you're going to be part of it. So I know who you are. So i got to say to you, when you feel like things are getting better, but they're still just not good enough. They're still just not where they should be in your life, in society, and all of that. Begin... To see yourself as God sees you. Because when he sees you, he doesn't see the failures. He sees what the final product is going to be. He sees who we can become. Let's pray. Have our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. It's interesting that the struggles that we often have where we try to get better, we try to accomplish certain things, we try to beat things in our lives that are maybe addictions as I've talked about or other things that just seem to, see, seem to keep cropping up in our lives. 
And sometimes we get in that cycle and we feel like, man, if I, if I just keep doing this, it's, it's no good. And I'm not a good Christian or I'm not a good believer. I'm not really a, a good follower of Jesus. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a phony and a fake and a fraud. And people really, uh, really, are, if they find out what I'm all about, then they're going to think that I'm really not following him. Well, you know what? There's great news. Because this was the story of his disciples. This was the story of the head disciple, the lead guy. But see, Jesus was seeing something different in Peter that Peter was even seeing in himself. Peter didn't know about his blind spots. He had what he thought was his belief, but it, that wound up being a blind spot. But Jesus said, Peter, I believe in you. And that's the thing. Jesus believes in you more than you may believe in him right now. That's a pretty, that's incredible. He believes in what you can become. He believes that you can come to him and you can make the right decision. He believed and loved you enough that he came and paid the penalty on the cross. You know, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. None of us are righteous, not one. There's none of us that seeks after God. It also tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you've never accepted Christ as Savior, you can do so right now, right there in your seat by quietly meaning this prayer, quietly whispering this prayer and say to God, Lord, I know that I've sinned against you. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And I accept him in my heart and life today. If you pray that prayer in just a moment, there are blue cards in front of you. Just take that blue card, fill it out, drop it in the offering plate as you leave this morning. Just put on the back that you pray that prayer so we can rejoice with you. Believer, where are you at today? Where's, where is that struggle area where you think, I'm trying to get better, but it's just not good enough. I'm trying to get better, but it's just not good enough. And it translates into, I'm not good enough. But let me tell you this, you're enough for Jesus. That's why he came. In the midst of sin, don't let it be a blind spot. Sin is sin. But in the midst of that blind spot, he loved you right where you're at and says, I don't want to leave you there. I want you to follow me. That's what he kept telling Peter. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Don't watch everybody else. Follow me. And that's the choice that we have to make today. That's a choice, basically, that even us as believers have to make every day. Because our blind spots come in and our, our own limiting belief systems and who we think we are versus who he says we are. I want us to make a commitment this week to see us as God sees us. And the only way to do that is to look at what Jesus says about people in the scriptures. You're going to see this one minute. People are, are sinners, but the next minute, the fact that he cared enough to come out of heaven and to live a human life and to die on the cross, he loved you that much that he came. Man, it's powerful. Let's remember that this week. When those blind spots come in, when those, those things happen and you're so frustrated, you think, man, I just can't seem to get victory over this. I just, I just can't seem to win. I, I just can't seem to beat this. I'm a horrible disciple. And Jesus goes, wait, I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. And when you come back around, use what you've been through to strengthen everybody else. See, your struggles are part of your story. And your story can be used to inspire other people. Even the story of when you've blown it, it can inspire people. It can strengthen others. Thank you once again for joining us both in person and online today. As we get ready to depart and to finish our day today and start this week, let's close in prayer. God, we thank you for the fact that we could be together today here and online. We pray that you'll bless each of these folks and the various messages that they have heard today. God, may we apply the principles to our lives this week, and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forever. Amen.